I'm Craig Klein. I'm uh, responsible for Red Hat's healthcare business in North America. So what we're going to take you through today is what we call healthcare interoperability in the new age of integration. So really what that means is there's a lot of changes going on in healthcare, and we believe it's extremely important from an interoperability interoper standpoint that you look at the end-to-end -end pieces that are in the inter interoperability chain. And you know, we'll talk about that, what the pieces are and why they're important. Um, and we'll also, I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, the industry as well and, and what, the, what changes are really fueling that stuff because you know, I, I look at it, it used to be, from an interoperability standpoint, it used to be a kind of a nice to have and now it's kind of a, it is a have to have. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, is just talk about Red Hat briefly and kind of give you an update of Red Hat and healthcare. This will be about one minute, but it's uh, why are we qualified to even talk about this stuff? Um, and then, then I'm gonna talk about the status quo and really what's different now that makes, it kind of changes the game. Um, and then as data comes in, what are some of the things that you can do with it? Some stuff that you may not even think of. We've got, you know, we've got customers that are doing anything, everything that I'm talking about. And then we're gonna talk about some examples of people that are doing um, exactly what we're talking about and we'll take a look at the future. So. So from a Red Hat perspective, I mean, you all know Red Hat, you're here, right? Um, you, you, you know, you get it, so I won't go into that. But I think what's important, if you look at over to the, the, the right, if you look at like the last four um, acquisitions that Red Hat made, so if you look at uh, something like a Feed Henry, which is our mobile platform, if you look at uh, Ceph, which is software-defined storage, if you look at Ansible um, from a a management standpoint and a company called Threescale, which I don't know if you all know that we did acquire it, uh, which is uh, API management. These four acquisitions are really, really important acquisitions for healthcare because they really help in what's going on with healthcare and we'll kind of describe what they are. But uh, you know, as Red Hat says, they have 90% of the Fortune 500 companies use Red Hat technologies. Um, you know, it's, if you look at healthcare, Every single one of the Fortune 500 companies in health in, in the Fortune 500 that's a healthcare company uses Red Hat and uses Red Hat in a big way. So we've actually done better than Red Hat itself. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. Um, if you look at the industries that we talk about when we talk about healthcare, look at the pharma industry, health systems, and, and payers, um, you can see the numbers there. Um, you know, we're in just about every single major payer health system and pharma company. The largest one in each of those segments are all major Red Hat customers using lots of our technology. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, if you look at healthcare, we call our merging products, which I guess is everything that's not REL. Um, over 40% of the business that healthcare gets is from non-REL business, which absolutely shocks a lot of people. And I, it's probably one of the highest percentage, if not the highest percentage within Red Hat. Uh, we've grown 40% year over year over the last eight years. Uh, last year we grew 39%, the year before we grew 38%, and I assure you it's a very big number because I have to carry it as a, as a, <laughs> in a unit. Uh, so we've done great for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, if you think about the EMR market with people like Epic and Cerner and McKesson and, and all these people, we probably have certainly in excess of 50% of every, every electronic medical record in the United States is running on Red Hat technology. So when you go into a hospital, most likely, you know, when you check in or do whatever, you can have Red Hat technology there too. But what we do is we partner with some of the key stakeholders in healthcare uh, to come up with where the technology fits, how to apply it, and how to use best cases with it. So that's basically what we do, and that's what Red Hat does for healthcare. So if, if you look at why interoperability is important. Um, I always go back to the, the uh, you know, past, present, and future. So if I look at it before the Affordable Care Act, which may be over at one o'clock today, I don't yeah. know, we'll split. it won't be over until after the Senate, but it's gonna be interesting. Um, you know, everything was kind of siloed. Um, everybody was claims and, you know, claim centric uh, with, with labs and, and uh, payments and whatever. It's pretty simple. I worked for Blue Cross of South Carolina for about 10 years. And the only thing that we really worried about is how fast we could process a claim and how cheap we could do it. 
you know, life was really simple, right? Um, not much change. That's probably why healthcare was probably behind the curve in terms of IT, which is a great opportunity. Um, if you look at now, you've got, you know, if you're in the provider space, you had meaningful use, which has morphed into macro. You've got, you know, value-based care, which basically has blown everything up. Um, you've got starting you know, population health, data's going crazy. And now you have, you know, had interoperability requirements out there. Um, that's quickly going to patient-centric healthcare, uh, where it's collaboration, value-based care is, you know, trains left the station and it's not coming back. And I'll go through that, and you start talking about digital healthcare and what have you. Um, it's it's scary. I mean, as a someone in IT and a healthcare entity, you can look at it two ways. What a great opportunity, or I'm scared half to death. Um, I would do the first one. You have a lot more fun. Um, but if you look at the, the market evolution, uh, you know, if you look at the basic trends here, you know, anybody that's in healthcare, I know everybody's trying to be more efficient, save money. Um, Value-based care is, is here. You got digital and, and mobile health innovation, consumer-directed health, um, and the industry is consolidating. But what that's doing is, if you look at things, if, if you look at it like a value-based care, you have dependence on interoperability. You, you just have to. So you have to employ technologies. And the last session I had things like rules and integration and API. But if you string these all together which we're going to talk about, they really form a complete integration model end to end, which is really important because it's not just getting the data, it's what you do with the data. And you're going to get started getting so much data that you can't possibly handle it all or store it all. So you've got to make decisions on what you do. But the technology needs are, are really changing, especially when it gets to the interoperability needs of value-based care and consumer-directed health. So basically what's really driving, I think, I think the big change that's really, uh, you know, kind of pushing, pushing everything is, you know, if you look at meaningful use, which is now morphed into macro, and I won't go on a, a, a tirade about that, um, and then you also have sustainable growth rate. So basically if you look at meaningful use, it was basically, you know, capturing the patient information in a coded format. So it was basically the EMR craze. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's over. And then it got into stage two where people started to choke on it, where it started to talk about you know, giving patients access to their, their health care records, um, bi-directional communication. Um, and then people were like, I don't know if I can do this. And then we went into, started going to stage three and people started putting the brakes on when it got into you know, patient access to, to a self-management tool. And then with macro, they tied in the sustainable growth rate. So you've got macro, which is you know, it's a federal program but it's going to end up in the commercial market. The same stuff you're going to have to do for that is going to boil into the commercial space. So I'm always asked when I, when I go around and people will ask me, you know, do you think this whole value-based care is going to stay? I mean, if I go back, go back in the early 80s when there was, um, you know, when uh, the Clintons were in the White House and Hillary tried to do health care and no one bought anything in health care for about a year and then it never got off the ground. So people were nervous about, is this, is this just, a, it's just a fad or is this going to continue? Well, if you look at this, this is from the HHS. And if you look at um, this, these right here, the dark colored, these are like alternate payment models level three and four, which I won't get into. But it's, this is the real serious stuff with this really kind of wood behind the arrow. You really have to do different things. And if you look at it from 2016 to 2018, it's going to about double. And this stuff, which is, which is macro as well, which is tied into this, I mean, that was done with bipartisan support. So what I believe and what I'm told is, you know, if the Affordable Care Act goes down, we have the, Amer what's it called? the American Health Care Act or whatever, Trump, everybody goes to call it. It's going to be Trump Care, but um, that all those provisions are going to stay. So it, it, we're there. So basically with that, with macro and, and the value-based care stuff, you have the sustainable growth rate replacement. You have MIPS and APMs, which are measurements that providers have to put in place and have to send in. Um, there's all kinds of quality measures. So there's new data, new, new measurements, new elements. And that's now driving income. So you basically have a world where if you can't produce this stuff and all this information that doesn't really exist anymore, it doesn't exist, never did, um, you're not going to get the same amount of money you made before. You're going to start to get penalized. So as I said in the beginning, it becomes, um, 
you know, not a nice to have with interoperability, it's a have to have or you're not gonna get paid. You know, when money gets involved, it gets real serious. So the only way you can do this stuff and to be able to deliver this is through interoperability. And interoperability a point that most people have never seen before. So with these changes, you've gotta do it quick, you've gotta do it cheap, you've gotta be able to do it agile and be able to scale. You've gotta have, do anything you can not to have any challenges with interoperability or any, you know, any, any lock-ins. You gotta do it, you gotta be secure. And as all this interoperability stuff goes around, everybody in healthcare is terrified with the security of you know, protected health information. So you know, it's a different world. So what you have is you have, uh, you know, if I look at you know, the end-to-end -end solution, what I'm talking about in terms of healthcare. So you now have with healthcare and some of the things I've talked about, you have you know, data coming from things like mobile, you have coming from wearables, from bedside devices, from other systems, all this information, so you have you know, mobile technologies and things like that, going through a cloud and then hitting something that we call complex event processing. So when it comes in, identifying it, what is it? What, what can I do with it? And then you, then you say, okay, I've, I've done all these integrations. Now can I apply rules to this data? And it, what can I do with it? Can I look at this data and all of a sudden say, I can make a decision on this data or send it and say, okay, I need to send this somewhere else to have another process done. So you get into things like you know, BPM or do I take this data that's coming from all these sources and I want to do population health on it? Can I virtualize all this data from all these sources? And then can I, you know, I can, can I send this to a, a data store that I can afford to do it with all this data? And if there's data I don't need, like for instance, if I'm measuring um, you know, my, my, uh, my heart rate, well, do I want to capture every heartbeat? I mean, that would be ridiculous. I want to, the only thing I want to capture is I want to capture when there is something that says, this is abnormal. So how do I determine that in this technology, whether it be you use rules technology or whether you use you know, uh, whatever you have to be able to, to, to make that work effectively. So you have technologies, you're employing you know, mobile technologies, you're employing integration technologies, you're employing rules technologies, you're employing BPM technologies, Dataverse technologies to be able to do all this and be able to take this information so you can do what healthcare is asking you to do. So it's not just a point-to-point -point integration anymore. It's a whole new world. So, so, so what I think people need to ask themselves is some really hard questions. Um, you know, you first got to ask yourself, you know, when you get the data in, what do you do with it? It's not that simple. Most of the integration technology data comes in and it, you know, either hard, hard coded somewhere or it comes in and you, you can go from point A to point B. There's a lot of stuff you want to do before you stick it into point B. Um, so it's what action can you take on it? Can I do things? Can I make decisions um, that make, you know, healthcare better? Um, can I expose it? So let's say I want to do uh, API management. Can I take this data and expose it? But not only that, can I do expose it, not just open APIs, but take it both direction? And maybe can I make a revenue model out of that API? You know, things, you, know, you got to think that way. Can you build it into a business process? So if something doesn't fit the mold, can I take this off and put it in a business process where I can action on it? Still within the framework, you know, I would still call that within the integration framework. And does this information have any value? And do I actually need to keep this data and determine this data, do I want to use it to put into my population health data to make clinical decisions on it? So you have to ask yourself, does your technology answer these questions? My guess, 99% of the time, the answer is no, and you really need to get there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Samir, and he can talk about some more details in terms of the technology. Sure. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Shot. <laughs> So Craig walked us through the current trends uh, and challenges in the healthcare industry and the importance of interoperability uh, to provide the high quality patient care as well as the key thing was to be much more well, well prepared to meet the changing regulation requirements, right? Um, 
the the thing is, uh, what we believe is that uh, when you look at interoperability, integration plays an important role. How do you actually connect that data together? How do you do those transformations? Because when you look at different enterprise systems, uh, they are not necessarily designed to talk to each other. Um, and the different things that Craig mentioned about the value-based care, uh, how do you actually implement those things? Uh, it's not about just connecting an EMR system with your existing enterprise system. It's about, okay, when you connect them, what about the insurance providers? What are you gonna do with that? Can you provide some higher value services to your doctors? Can you provide some higher value services to your patients? It's also about the patients, right? I mean, it's not just collecting the EMR data and about the patients. It's also about what, do you, what are the things that you could provide now more to your patients to, so that they can actually make much more informed decisions. All of that has to be looked into as, as you look at your technology foundation. Uh, so what we feel is that you need a new, a different technology foundation to actually enable you to do the interoperability. Uh, a modern technology foundation that um, that actually has at least uh, three important capabilities or kind of like foundational capabilities to help you prepare yourself, prepare your architecture. Uh, the first one is more about distributed integration. What we mean by this is an integration that is lightweight, a capability that is lightweight, that is patterns based, event oriented, and you can deploy this integration where you want it to be deployed. And I'll kind of give you some examples later, kind of tell you the importance of that. Uh, and this is different than uh, what a typical uh, solution you may be getting from, say, Oracle JCAPS type of technology, or a point solution like what, say, um, uh, Rhapsody Orion or those uh, Cloverleaf providers, which is just about integrating an EMR with one particular system. So the distributed integration is more about how you can connect the systems, but the solutions that you do, how you can now deploy it to where you want it to be deployed. That's the key thing. Again, connecting the healthcare data and deploying it where you want it to be deployed. The second key capability is about APIs. APIs are becoming increasingly important overall, and specifically in healthcare. Having an overall API strategy is important as you start thinking about your solutions, as you start thinking about your internal infrastructure, as you start thinking about your architecture, uh, because APIs are kind of becoming language of business. They're kind of long language of collaboration. Uh, that they are now increasingly becoming ways by which uh, different entities actually talk to each other. And I'll give you some more examples in the next slide, but having an API foundation strategy, how you can actually develop those APIs, connect those APIs, and then once you do that, security of those APIs, how you manage those APIs, analytics of those APIs become very, very important because now you're preparing yourself to do more higher level services, the value-based services, and I'll provide some examples later. And the third capability is about containers. I'm sure you're at the Red Hat Summit, you have heard about containers. If you're not heard about containers, I don't know, we're just not doing a good job, but you must have heard about containers. So uh, again, containers provide you a profoundly new way to now, um, I, I kind of like to call it three, to develop your applications, to deploy your applications, and to manage your applications. Again, very, very different than what used to happen earlier. Earlier, you would have, a, like, uh, you, I mean, we, we transformed from installing our applications on premise to VMware, like to say, for example, like a VM-based application, and now the containers are by far changing the entire landscape in terms of how you can now develop your application. So having a, this is kind of more about thinking about your platform architecture so that these capabilities are there as you start thinking about your architectures. So that's the key thing that we wanted to uh, talk about here. So having an integration architecture that has these capabilities is actually very, very important. I spoke about APIs, right? So now let's just talk about APIs in healthcare. So APIs are increasingly used, as I said, in different verticals, different industries, uh, again, often becoming very much uh, kind of like a language of collaboration. Different APIs, right? You can have APIs to now say, for example, uh, Facebook has its own APIs. So if you develop an application for Facebook, you can tap into the Facebook APIs to now provide higher level services to your customers. This is just an, a, a quick example, but then you can have, say for example, one of our customers is Oxford Dictionary, and what they do is their dictionary information, they actually share it to the outside customers via an API. Advantage of that is once you now, that information is opened up, you can now have much more collaborative relationship between your different suppliers and partners. And, and, and the advantage with APIs is it's, it's, it's like you, once you have that information opened up, you can share it with multiple entities and you can have different tiers of collaboration. 
that's the key thing. So if, if, you, if you now map APIs to healthcare, there are different opportunities here. Let's take a look at patients, right? The one of the very much difficult aspect with any patient, including us today, is an easy and efficient access to our own data. I mean, I have a different primary care physician, my wife has a different, the way we get information is so different all the time. And how I can now, if, if I'm been referred to a hospital, how that happens, like my, my information, how that is, in, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's confusing. It's not that easy for us to get that information. But also the key thing is having an easier access, APIs provide you an easier access to that data. But the other important aspect is how you can actually share this information with your other key decision makers. This is very, very important in healthcare because oftentimes, sometimes you may not be in your best position to make your informed decision. So you might have to share that information maybe to your spouse or to be to your to your son or daughter and that's incredibly important. How do you even do that? What is a way means by which you can do that? If you do it an API strategy, maybe you can create a mobile app that allows different people to now access it and access that same data. Second one is when you look from a provider's perspective, um, you can, one of the difficulties with a lot of providers as they transition to the value-based care is of, I often hear is that a lot of doctors, they were used to their old systems. So now with the new system, it's kind of difficult for them to now transition. So with the APIs, you can now provide much more innovative and much more easier to use interfaces. At the same time, you can actually provide much more analytical information to support, support much more clinical decisions. So for example, it could be that I have 10 patients who came in today and they had this particular symptoms. Can I get that real-time information quickly today? Not two days later, today itself. The third one is when you look at researchers. When you look at researchers, uh, they can have access to the clinical and claim data. If APIs allow them to access that, this is an opportunity. I mean, it's not that it's all like given to you. It, it's an opportunity for now you to now get access to this clinical and claim data, as well as now you can identify trends. The same research data now could be shared with different other researchers. Now, when you look at overall medical, like pharmaceutical industry, how you can actually share this information, this becomes incredibly important. And last but not the least, developers themselves, when you design using an API, when you use an API-based approach, you can now design and develop new apps much more quickly, new innovative apps, because as you start, I mean, any healthcare company today, right, a lot of, oftentimes you kind of, you'll start hearing um, that they are transforming themselves to be not necessarily just a healthcare company, but much more about doing much more patient-centric information. They're, they're doing a technology transformation to be much more te uh, technologically advanced to provide those newer services. So as you, as you reach to your customers in new ways, APIs provide you a great foundation to now provide those services. So again, overall APIs in healthcare is becoming very important. So moving now directly to a product that we, the, or the capabilities that we offer. Um, so Craig kind of have spoke about a couple of those prod, uh, products, but so overall from an integration perspective, um, the, the capability that, uh, that we offer is actually implemented in this product called Red Hat JBoss Fuse. And it's our lightweight uh, integration platform that helps you connect your healthcare data, APIs, as well as processes. So think of it that as an API, allows you to create an API foundation. As I said, it's not just connecting one, app, like the EM, EMR application to just one application, but when you do that, can you create an API foundation so that that same information now can, could be shared with your other entities, other important healthcare entities? Again, uh, the other aspect also is uh, when you do this, uh, to deploy that integrations or services where you want it to be deployed. As you are now seeing new types of architecture like microservices style architectures, you need a way by which you can actually now start being part of that, how you can actually be that. Much more quicker services, innovative services. Fuse allows you to create those quicker services. It comes with all the capabilities that you need for integration, like transformation capability, connectivity, includes more than 150 connectors. You can connect all the way from your, um, uh, from your uh, like file or database to Salesforce as a CRM. So now think about the opportunities <laughs> that it gives you, not only create, connecting your EMR, but connecting multiple other systems using the same platform. And uh, it supports the healthcare standard HL7 otherwise, and, uh, and provides multiple connectivity. So again, a great way by which you can actually now connect your applications and, uh, and creates an API foundation. The other one is I was talking about um, APIs. Is, so Fuse allows you to now create those APIs, connect those APIs. 
Uh, Three Scale is a company that we acquired um, last year. Um, actually, at summit, we last summit we made that announcement. And Three Scale is, um, and we're really excited about uh, Three Scale as a product, and it, and it really fits in our product portfolio and capability. Um, it's more, uh, it's like a, it's like a full lifecycle API management platform. So think about it as like you created those APIs, but now you want to manage those APIs. You want to secure those APIs. You want to scale those APIs. And the most important aspect is to share those APIs, creating those developer ecosystems. So if you're part of a healthcare organization, now you have several teams. Maybe you have a pharma team, a research team. You can actually create all these APIs and you can share those APIs and can among your, within your teams. So three scale up provides you all those capabilities that allows you to do that. Again, uh, secure those APIs, connect those APIs, and col collaborate on the APIs. Another important thing with Rescale, it provides you API usage in, insights. So essentially, you can say that, hey, if I have an API, and I want to know how many times the API is being called, who is calling my API, you can get all sides of those insights into an API. And now when you combine Fuse with Rescale and OpenShift, what you're getting is a different platform by which you can now create your microservices style applications. Again, you don't necessarily have to create a microservices only, but it's a path for you to be well prepared to provide your applications. So again, when you now create your applications, integration applications or any other application, you can not only create them, you can deploy them on OpenShift, and it could be part of your CI, CD, or continuous development life cycle. So you can deploy them, check something, experiment something. If it doesn't work, do that again. This is very, very important. I have worked with uh, healthcare companies before. I used to work for Genzyme, which is a pharmaceutical company here. One of the big problems was the projects would take like six months, seven months, eight months for you to deploy. So if you're trying out new things, it was incredibly difficult to try, try and especially in a regulated environment, it was not easy. But if you now create an infrastructure and architecture that allows you to experiment something in a much quicker way, even we, when we wanted to do that, we couldn't do it with the existing technology. With this technology, with this technology base, you can now, you're in a position to now start experimenting with that. So again, not necessarily you take it everything and deploy all in production, but you know it's a pathway, it's a foundation for you to start thinking about it. Uh, along with those integration, I mean, overall with Red Hat uh, and the middleware portfolio, we have broad capabilities beyond just integration and API management. Some of the things that um, Craig highlighted earlier were the uh, JBoss BRMS and the BPM suite capabilities. With the BRMS, it's much, much more about decision management platform, again, business rules. Think about business rules, that's what BRMS is. Becomes very, very important as we start seeing the data coming in from different, say, for example, from medical device or from a phone, mobile phone. Uh, that when the data is coming in, integration allows you to connect that data, but then you maybe you want to make some real-time decisions on it, like look at patterns. BRMS allows you to do that. BPM suite allows you to now automate your business processes, create your business processes. So again, all these technologies are available as part of our portfolio. So let's look at some examples of customers who have been now um, taking this path and actually um, having some great benefits using this technology. So first is um, Davita. Uh, it's a um, healthcare organization um, specializing in uh, kidney dialysis. Uh, the big problem they had was uh, they had a large deployment of um, kind of legacy and unsupported JCAPS technology. Again, I mentioned Oracle JCAPS earlier. It's a ESB type technology it has been there for, it had a lot of support for healthcare standards. So that's why it became very popular in healthcare. Um, and the challenge with them was um, it was unsupported. It was end of life and they just couldn't innovate that faster. As business started demanding much more newer services, they just couldn't innovate that faster. So what they did was they did they uh, they did a small POC using JBoss Fuse as an integration platform, quite successful. And then uh, they actually now standardize on JBoss Fuse as, as an integration platform. Uh, they created a central information repository um, and an enterprise master patient index information, all based on the kind of uh, with the regulation and HL7 standards. Uh, the advantage that they got was um, with the pattern-based integration, which I mentioned earlier about Fuse, they had a lot of uh, improvements in their development life cycle, in their operational life cycle. They were able to do this in a much more quicker fashion. They were able to now integrate or connect a lot of the new information streams that were coming in, which was very difficult with their older technology. At the same time, they were able to adapt to new requirements that were coming in a much more effective way. And uh, they were able to do this to, and also lower their overall maintenance cost. It was very, very important. We have this case study, and we can always uh, share it with you all. 
the next one is, um, is this uh, US-based uh, not-for-profit uh, hospital based out of uh, US Waste Coast, I can't name it here. Um, they had a similar challenge. The challenge with them was, again, we see a lot of this uh, older legacy Oracle JCAPS technology. They were using that, um, couldn't innovate with that. It was difficult with, I mean, it's very similar to what Davita was having. Again, couldn't innovate much faster. New requirements coming in, regulations, and then think about it. You're in a situation, you're to support this. How are you going to do that, right? What they did was they built a successful proof of concept uh, based on Red Hat JBoss Fuse and, and, and Red Hat technologies. And uh, the, the incredible thing was because of the lightweight nature of the platform, because of the, of the enterprise integration patterns based platform, they were able to migrate almost 90, in 90 day, 300 interfaces uh, into this new platform. Again, uh, the way they did that also was no impact to their ongoing applications. Again, an incredible uh, benefit that the customer had. And again, if you need more details, we can certainly um, offer those details to you. The third one is uh, TMG Health. So TMG Health is, uh, is a national provider for uh, business process services for uh, Medicaid and Medicare um, systems. And um, the, the key thing with them was, uh, the, the challenge with them was a lot of their information exchange between their systems and all the medical entities like say pharmacy was a, it was a daily batch process. And sometimes it was much more monthly. The problem with that approach, the customers were demanding much more real time information. Example of that is, um, I, I'm a patient, I go to my PCP in the morning and uh, say I'm, done with my out-of-pocket expense. Later in the day, in the afternoon, I say go to pharmacy. I shouldn't be charged for it, right? Because I'm out of my out-of-pocket expense. I mean, I'm done with me. But if I now charge, because they didn't have that same inform real-time information exchange, what happened is you would be charged for it, and then you would be all reimbursed. Now look at the cost, the people who are now trying to support them, right? So what they did was they deployed a new Medicaid uh, operating model sys platform you based on Red Hat JBoss Fuse as an integration platform, but also the Red Hat JBoss BPM suite platform to now not only now connect their information together in real time, so again, connecting to the pharmacy data, connecting to their internal system, connecting to the, to, to the, uh, to the doctor information, but also use the BPM suite product to now automate their business processes. And again, here again, an example of they reduce their development life cycle of, uh, by, all, by almost 75%. And now they're able to track data much more effectively and efficiently. Uh, this is again a case study we already have. Again, we can share it with you. Again, a uh, public case study. These are just some examples of customers that I, I wanted to highlight here who have been now going on this path. Now again, all of these customers, now it's not necessary that they use all of our products. The key thing with them is they need a technology foundation to be much more better prepared. And using, thinking about their strategy for them, it was not that they have to use Fuse and 3Scale and OpenShift and everything at one time. But once you start looking at your technology strategy and your architecture, we can start thinking about, okay, I need to go here. And you know we can take baby steps to actually go there. But it's important to think about it as an overall strategy. Instead of just saying, I want to connect my one system to the other and okay, you're done with one, 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 one project and okay, let's move on. So that's kind of what's going to be my main message uh, about overall technology foundation. Great. Great. So I'm going to summarize real quick and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. So I guess, I guess in summary, um, obviously the healthcare environment is changing extremely quickly, um, more quickly than most people can deal with. Um, the stakes are higher, as I said earlier, you know, it's now money involved. People are going to get paid less money if they can't produce the information that they need. Uh, it's critical that, that you know, these environments in healthcare, which are very old, get, get uh, modernized and the integration environments get modernized. And I guess the point is yesterday's technology just can't position where you need to be in the future and do it fast enough. So change is, is required. And the last slide I wanted to show is this, and when I, I, I put this slide together, um, and it was really, I, I didn't know what would happen when I put it together, when, when it, and so what I did here is you look at the composite score down here, so you got one point if you had a yes for the, the technology, in, in, integrated technology, you got a half a point for, you know, say it was a limited or whatever. Um, so if you look at it, 
So here, I'm not going to use any names because we're not going to, we're protecting the innocent, but these are the, basically the, the four big competitors in the United States. The interesting thing is the ones that have the largest installed base out there in the market are the ones that scored a two and a one. Pretty simply because they've been out there longer. Um, and when it was point to point and it didn't matter, these were great point to point solutions. So if you look at what we're coming up with here, so if you look at what I'm, so you've got, you know, as a product open, which is pretty important in interoperability, some of these products are extremely proprietary, which again, in, you know, at a, at a Red Hat conference, that's pretty important. We all kind of have that beaten in our head for the last four days. But if you look at things like, API management and a full ESB, BPM, rules, mobile, complex event processing is a technology current. If you look at all these things here, every one of our customers that have our products and using it for integration may not, as Samir said, may not use them all. But I'll give an example of the, the, the middle example. They put in Fuse and they did all these, they, they did 300 conversions. They found after a year they say, okay, we can do more with this product. They said, I'm gonna integrate rules with it. And what they were able to do by putting rules in it, and it was all integrated, they were able to save tons and tons more money and make the whole process much easier. So these things, in my opinion, when I went through what I, these things, in my opinion, are absolutely critically important to have in an integration stack. And if you don't have the availability to do this, or you have to get a third party product, or you have something that, you know, we may have API management, um, you know, somewhere and they say, okay, we have open APIs. Well, that's, that's nice, but that's one directional. And you also can't monetize it. So each one of these products here from a, from a Red Hat environment, each one of these products can stand alone and are, are competitive with everything in the marketplace. So you've got a point to point solution that, you know, I'm a little biased, scored a nine, but even if some of this is not 100% accurate, Things change from time to time. It's not even close. So what we believe is we have a stack that's really, very, very flexible, and it does what everything that has to be done to be able to allow you to connect to today's healthcare environment, and it's critical that we do it. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, that's a five-part question. So. <laughs> um, I'll take the last piece from, you know, we do a, lots of business in the public environments. For instance, most people don't know that healthcare.gov is written on top of all the technology that you're seeing up here, all our technology. We didn't create the problem, we fixed it. But um, So we do a lot of work in the, in the, in the public space. We're also um, a member of the HIMSS Innovation Center, um, which is a kind of a think tank of the major organizations within healthcare. So, you know, we try to come up with Anything we can come up to try to make integration better, it's, it's terrible. All the names of all the companies that you mentioned are all customers of ours. Um, and we work with them and, you know, it, 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 we, we try and, and have been successful some places not to get them to adopt more open technologies um, in their product stacks to make it easier. And we work with them. I've got an ISV team that goes out and works with these people to get them to adopt more and more technologies. So the more that we can do, um, and the more that we can do in that space, it helps everything connect. I will tell you, again, some of these examples, you know, they have Epic systems, and, you know, we integrate in the Epic systems using their API programs um, and things like that. So we've got experience working with the systems. Um, integrating with these systems can, can help, um, but you're right, it's, a, it's not an easy answer in healthcare. Uh, my running joke was if you've seen um, you know, H one HL7, you know, you've, seen, you've seen one because they're all different because they were too flexible. So um, fire, the fire standards has a chance. Um, it's going to take a strong push, I think, from the government to say, you know, you, you look at the financial markets and you, you can sit there and you can transfer money all over the world, but you can't transfer a lab with any, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. So hopefully fire will be there. Um, I think a lot of people are betting on it. I don't know. I mean, you know, you had the X12 standards and things like that that were better, but that's probably one of the biggest problems in healthcare with interoperability. That's why you need a lot of products that do a lot of, you know, flexibility, a lot of mapping, a lot of 
transformation or whatever. That's what makes it so difficult because there aren't any standards and it's not, it shouldn't be that hard, but it is. I mean, it, it's being looked into right now. I mean, I don't have any exact timelines. I mean, right now we support the HL7 version one, I believe. Um, two, two. Ver version two, yeah. I believe. And then that they're looking into that right now. So I don't have like exact timelines. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a client that's actually going up on it right now. And in, in a, I don't know the, the, yeah. the right word to use is in a test environment, and the, the, we're, we're going to be bringing fire into the, the platform probably, I'm, I'm going to guess, maybe in the summertime uh, as part of it. Um, I think everything we do will be upstream, sure. camel first, yeah. So you'll start seeing it over there first. You know, there's, um, if you look at it, the, uh, the, the few spec is in, um, in the happy, the happy environment, happy. right? Yeah. So we've actually met many times with the, actually the, the guy from uh, the happy guy in, uh, he actually is in Canada that actually is the lead contributor. I mean, we've had multiple conversations with him to try to take a look at it all together and even talk about things like making the HL7 uh, map or environment a little more flexible that you can so you can do more with it. So yeah, we're, we're having those conversations. I'd like the answer would be yes. I, I think it's too early. Um, to know, um, I, I know that um, there's talk about it, but I, I just worry if you look what's out there now, it's just, they're gonna say, well, it's gonna be, this is gonna be the standard, but you're gonna have, you can use this and this for something else, which basically means that it's not a standard anymore. I, I go back to like when they did the, uh, they went from the NSF to the 4010 claim, I don't know if any of you guys remember back then, but they had six user definable fields so they did all this stuff and they went through a standard and it was an absolute horror show because anybody could stick whatever they wanted to in those six fields. So the standard became not a standard. It's like HL7. It's, it's, I don't understand. There's a lot of people in the industry that are trying really, really hard to do it. I, I, you know, a lot of it has to do with lobbyists and you know, a lot of these you know, the, the vendors. I, I, I don't know if they want to have as much integration, but it's going to have to happen because if you think about what's happening with MACRA and you know MACRA's ball on the you know the Medicare side, you, you, that's going to spill over to the commercial markets. It, it's it's going to because companies are going to look at they can get a competitive advantage. They can say, well, I can do this or I can offer a plan if you, you do these type of things. It's it's going to get there. So I sure hope they do it, but I don't know. I really don't know. It's it'll get better. How fast? I don't know. But again, I guess if you look at it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. The, techno the technology we have allows you to be able to do it and make decisions on it. As crazy as it is, um, it makes it as simple as it can be. It's not simple. No. <laughs> no. 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 I've been in it for uh, 37 years, so. It was, it was simple when you had to worry about a claim and how fast you process it. That was easy, but not anymore. Yeah. It, and it gets worse every day. So. Does the uh, architecture you showed with the three scale in front of uh, SKUs and DPMs, mm -hmm. so have you implemented that in that whole architecture? In well, not in no, those three, no, no. Not in these three clients. So they are kind of in the path of doing it. So mostly all the three that I mentioned right now, they're using Fuse today. And they are in the path of, I think, evaluating OpenShift in some so form or the other. On uh, in the cloud? They're, on, they're all on-prem on on, right, on, on, on right now. So it's only uh, SaaS providers? No, no. we mm -hmm. just, uh, on uh, last week, we, we basically, uh, made it available on premise also which is big for health which is big but for they haven't no. That yet. no 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 so we've got people that are using but see if you, if you look at let's say there's 10 products in that suite you've got people that are using all of it people using combination of it but we're seeing people morph into more and more and more of it because i think all the technologies apply but it's it's like anything else in healthcare they're they're walking toward it do we have anybody that has everything probably not I mean, people just, that are close. You, I mean, if you're looking, uh, if you're asking me specifically about the three things that I was talking about, like the distributed integration, API management, and OpenShift, 
uh, the uh, Skipol Airport does that. So Skipol Airport, we just did a press release uh, on Monday, I believe, uh, that talks about that. Skipol Airport actually does something similar. Um, there's another one, then there's various combinations of customers who are doing uh, Fuse and 3Scale. That's actually a good combination of creating APIs, connecting APIs, and managing them. So Flytogate is another customer out of EMEA who actually does something similar. So there are other customers who are implemented on, right. are implemented. Healthcare, the, you know, as we all know, healthcare from a technology usually drags behind everything else. So yeah. the good the good news is is you know we've got the stuff like that you know implemented in yep. other areas and huge environments. So it's easy to roll it into healthcare, but healthcare really they actually need it more than the other people do, but they're just yeah. getting there because, exactly. but, you know, now it's a, you have to have it. Yeah, I mean, it's look not, at, it's not, I mean, even the Innovation Award winners today, right, like, like Barclays, they use the same stack. They don't use three scale now, but again, every customer is in a different phase of their adoption. But I, what they like is the architecture that they and, and uh, that they get, the foundation that they get. And every customer, different customers come from a different path. Some will come more from, uh, I'm going to create my API foundation. That's what Skipo Report did. They started, okay, I'm going to create my API foundation first. Then they said, okay, I, we were able to create our API foundation, and I'm going to manage it using three scale. A lot of times what happens is often the discussion comes just as API management, but then if you don't have APIs, what are you going to manage, right? So. Skipo Report started on that path. Then they realized that, okay, we need a infrastructure to actually support this. And then they said, okay, let's do all of this on OpenShift. So every customer does it in a different way. Right. So what I would say is, again, um, I have experienced this before. I, before joining Red Hat, I used to be an architect uh, working for Genzyme, as I mentioned earlier. So I've seen this, right? So a lot of times, uh, the advantage that you get is, uh, yeah, you're going to always have new vendors uh, coming in with their own technology, right? You can't stop that. Um, what, is what is happening is there has been an adoption in the industry that a lot of times uh, these new vendors or new apps are often are using APIs to expose their applications or their interfaces. So one way you can do that is when you use an integration technology and architecture is you can use those APIs to now interface between different applications. And with Fuse, there are using those patterns. It's easy to now do that, to again connect that. But when you do it that way, you at least have a standard way by which you can do these integrations or connections. The challenge that happens in a lot of those cases is if you do it point by point for each and every new vendor and application that you're coming, now, if you remember earlier days, we would be talking about spaghetti code. You're going to get the same spaghetti code in so many different ways. At least with the patterns that we have in, in Camel, it's easier to do that. And you can now say, OK, I'm going to do this. So if, and, and, and the advantage with Camel is that Camel is kind of like the main open source technology included with Fuse. The advantage with Fuse, with, with Fuse and Camel is that depending upon your endpoint requirement, you can do it. So for example, if an endpoint says that the only way you can interface with me is you drop a file. It happens so many times. I've seen that. Vendors say, you know what? I'm not going to open my API. Drop a file. You can still do it. If someone may say that, you know what? You can only interface with me talking to my database. Again, I hope it doesn't happen, but you can still do it. Or an open API, you can use all of that. So I think having an architecture like this allows you to now create that common platform and a standardized platform that allows you to now do these connections. Yeah, but, but the second example was one of the 10th largest health systems in the United States. So as I said, they did 300 connections in 90 days, which is, makes people's yeah. heads spin. Um, the reason they were able to do it, and they have Epic, and they have Cerner Systems, and they've got McKesson Labs, and then they, you know the drill, it's more systems you could shake a stick at. But they were able to do it extremely fast by the technologies that, that you have within within Fuse. It's got 150 different connections. It's a, you know, it's a, I guess ES, we don't need that terms, but it's a full ESB. It, I mean, it makes this easy where if you're looking at some of these other technologies, it's not built to do that. It's built to go come and go here to here, and then you end up with stuff everywhere and it breaks and what have you. So you know, you have, what they did is they took the Fuse, were able to do all these integrations very quickly, and said, let's try putting rules on top of it and see what else I can do. Can I do rules to make these transformations easier? And it's, and it's working. So um, that's the power of a tool. But it's, it's healthcare, it's a, it's a nightmare. So, <laughs> so. Well, I appreciate everybody for coming. Um, yep.
you know, that's, thanks for coming to Summit. Thanks for coming. And uh, hope you enjoy the session. But thanks. Yeah. Thank you.